So we're going to have uh, now the uh, first lecture by Christian Tomasetti from uh, City of Hope, and the set of lectures will be revolving around uh, cancer uh, and uh, mathematical modeling and uh, machine learning uh, applications. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, can you can you hear me well? It's it's good enough. Yeah. Um, so it's great to be here, and uh, thank you for for being here and and listening to this. Hopefully, you'll find the of some interest. Um, so just one second well disclosures i always have a disclosure in the other states you have i don't know if it's, this is the case in italy too but in the united states you always have to disclose your disclosures so there are uh, uh, those disclosures uh i wanted to mention before starting with the lecture i wanted to introduce one second um this uh this the place where i work at. so city of hope it's um uh, I was at Johns Hopkins, which is a standard university academic institution. And then this, this very January, actually, in the middle of the month, I transferred, I moved to uh, City of Hope, which is a cancer center, but also they have a graduate school uh, beside the research institute. So they do PhDs and, and all of that. But of course, the focus there is on cancer. Okay. And um, uh, one of the reasons why I went there is because uh, we opened this uh, uh, new division uh, that it's focused on, uh, uh, basically it's a, it's a mathematical division. So it's focused on quantitative methods for uh, understanding cancer evolution. So how you go from a healthy tissue to a cancer, as well as uh, on cancer early detection. Okay. And this is, both doing um, uh, liquid biopsies, so looking at liquids of our body that can inform us about what is happening in a patient, as well as through imaging, okay? So uh, AI neuro, you know, methods for uh, detecting cancer early. And, um, and, and here, is, here is a little bit of the structure of, of you know, of the center they open, open there. And I guess I'm showing this, um, uh, well, for two reasons. The first one is, I guess, as um, um, just to say that um, um, what is cool ab about this uh, center, um, otherwise I would not have moved. I would have stayed like, you know, as a, where I was, um, is that um, for, in my opinion, for the first time, one of these cancer centers created an entity, which is this center, where there is both a technological branch as well as a clinical branch under the same center. So what that means is, as you can see in the figure here, what that means is that uh, we have uh, this division of uh, mathematicians. Uh, by the way, let me also say for those that are interested, uh, Sophie is here. She's on, on the math side, she work, uh, works with me and she leads that effort. But we have statistics and machine learning and AI. And so uh, working with this group, which is at the bottom of this division in the graduate school, then <clears throat> and in the research institute, then uh, on one side, we have a group that develops new technologies, okay? So literally I have, say, Fai, Sophie, or one of the, people working with us or students come up with a new idea. We literally next day can have someone in a, whether it's a wet lab or whatever that is, testing those ideas, okay? Which is quite cool. Um, and there are labs obviously that can do that, but what is very unique I think is then uh, we have uh, within the same center also the clinical side, okay? And so we literally can have uh, patient samples and apply these methodologies right away, which makes things very easy. Uh, even major centers like, you know, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, if you want to try to do something like that, you have essentially to put together multiple principal investigators and uh, it's, it's, it's very messy. So I'm, I'm excited about the center and I guess I'm, I'm also saying uh, uh, by the way, it's very beautiful uh, from the window. Uh, I'm just noticing. 
uh, the I'm uh, I'm saying also because we are always looking for uh, uh, students and 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 people that would like to collaborate with us. And in fact, this in part was originated by you know from a conversation I had with the organizers of this conference here today. So please let us know or, or let us know if anyone is interested in, in working on these topics, and I, I'm happy to talk to you. Um, and, and we do this uh, with people you know, on site, but also there are plenty of people that work off site with us. Okay, so the, <clears throat> now getting to, to the lectures, um, I, I hope you will like what I prepared, but uh, I wanted to uh, present my, the three main directions I work on. Um, but I wanted to do a, um, in, in the style that I try to have in my research anyway, and we does, does the work with me know that, which is um, I'm really interested in the actual problem that I'm trying to solve in, in biology and medicine, okay? And so, uh, you know, when I grew up, when I was at your stage, and here I'm talking to the PhD students in the room, which I'm assuming there are a, there are a few. So during my PhD, uh, it's when I learn about using mathematics in understanding cancer evolution and all of that. So that's when I started. And luckily for me, I realized pretty quickly that there were a lot of mathematicians going around looking for applications where they could use their particular partial differential equation that they knew how to solve, okay? So they would go to the department next door, you know, the biology department and say, hey, anything where you have this type of situation, because I have these equations, they are really good and, you know, I know how to solve them and blah, blah, blah. By the way, I'm not saying this in, a, in any way, in a negative way, okay? This is fine. This is absolutely fine. But um, it's one way to approach it, okay? And, and we need, obviously, uh, uh, people that are really interested in the particular methodology, you know, whether it's mathematical, whether it's statistical, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And that is their main focus. And then the application is kind of, you know, um, a nice consequence of applying these methodologies that they develop. Okay, I'm not that guy. Okay, so it may be very disappointing to you, depending on how you view things. I, I've actually, at that time, when I saw that that was the reality in, in my field, um, I thought that from my point of view, I wanted to do the reverse. Okay, so I wanted to start with a problem that say I thought was important. And, um, and often I ended up using tools that are very, very simple. And you will see some examples, okay? So I'm going to be shameless in showing you that sometimes we use very basic things, okay? Um, but in that way, uh, but that's, that's what I chose, okay? So again, there is no right or wrong way to do it. But um, um, I think it's important to mention that because it's a major career decision that with my PhD students at Hopkins, you know, we had to discuss always. It was, are you going to go for methodology? Because it takes a lot of effort to, to really be at the forefront of, you know, whatever is new machine learning. You have to be very familiar with all the literature and so on. So is that what you want to do or you know, you pick an application and then, and then you really have to spend a good amount of time learning about the biology of that particular problem, right? And then, and then the math, the stat, or the machine learning becomes the tool that you have absolutely familiar with, good, you know, enough to tackle those problems, okay? So those are two perspectives, and I'm here just to, I, I was just saying I'm of the second type, all right? So, um, and as I said, uh, over these three days, uh, I plan to show you three directions. The first one, they are all related to cancer because that, that's what I've been doing. Um, great majority of what I've been doing is on cancer. And, um, 
um, in the first in the first lecture, which is today, we are going to talk about cancer etiology. Etiology it's a fancy word, just meaning the, you know the causes of something, right? So what is the cause of cancer? And and I'll show you a little machine learning and uh, some methodologies which we call mutational signatures, which are useful to address what causes cancer. Okay. And then tomorrow we'll do a little bit more math and uh, just a little bit more. Okay. I'm not going through methods or it's really just showing you. I, I want to show you, I want to show you the problems, the biological issues, and how we think about it and how we tackle them. Okay. Uh, so there we'll do mathematical modeling or cancer evolution. That's the part I, I work with Sophie. We, we just published a paper a week ago, which we are very happy. And, and I'll, I'll talk a, a good amount about that. And then finally, in the third lecture, um, we are back to more you know, machine learning stuff, where I'll discuss something that today, I think it's, at least in cancer, it's a pretty important topic of the liquid biopsies, all right? So essentially blood tests usually, uh, but it can be other liquids. Okay, so sometimes these things can be done in urine or, but liquid biopsies and then applying some machine learning tools to detect cancer early. And uh, there are, it's, it's, a, it's really an exploding field and um, that can, and I believe, and I'll tell you a lot more uh, on Thursday, I believe can really change the outlook of cancer. Okay, and how terrible this disease is today. Uh, so, in, in my opinion, imp important problems. Otherwise, of course, I wouldn't be working on those. And uh, so, today we we'll start with cancer etiology. And by the way, I'll, uh, as, as I already told you, you know, my students when they start with me for the first few months feel lost because they are like, I was doing, you know, whether it was statistics or whatever they were math, whatever they were doing. It's like. You are just having me do biology it's three months. The all I, I all I see is biology, right? I kind of throw it, throw them in the water because for me it's a test of how serious they are in learning what the actual problem is. Okay, so I, here I'll tell you a little bit the story about what happened in this research direction. So um, uh, in two thousand. 12, 13, when I started thinking about this problem. Uh, here, this actually is, these are screenshots for 2014, 15. If you went online, okay, and said, and Google, what causes cancer, right? Or say someone in, of your relatives or a friend is, was diagnosed with cancer, um, a parent with, with their child, right? Diagnosed with cancer, goes home and checks what causes cancer. Here is the answer that was given by um, the main uh, sources of information, both for the general public as well as from organizations that are specific for science or, you know, they're focused on scientists. Um, and so, you know, I put Wikipedia as well as uh, Cancer Research UK, for example. And the answer is, you, you don't need to read it, just the, the, the answer is, uh, or the answer was, Essentially, cancer was caused by uh, the environment, so environmental exposures, uh, pollution, for example, okay, um, or sun exposure, excessive sun exposure, or uh, and in the environment, this may be weird if you are new to the field. It was weird to me the first time I heard it, but you know, lifestyle factors, so smoking, drinking, bad diet, these are all classify under, under the environment category, okay? Um, because you can think of them as something that, you, you know, comes from the outside to your body. And by the way, I call them E factors for brevity. So sometimes you will hear me say the E factors. Uh, and then the other source being hereditary factors. So mutations that we inherit from our parents, okay? <clears throat> That's it. I mean, as you can see in this first figure, Cancer Research UK, it's smoking, it's diet, there is, you know, obesity with the scale, uh, alcohol, sun exposure, lack of 
exercise and, and so on, okay? Oh, by the way, I forgot to say something very important. Please stop me anytime if you have a question they would like to ask, okay? I mean, we can do questions at the end. I don't know if we do any, yeah, we can do questions at the end too, but I would much rather answer a question on the spot if, if you have one that you would like to ask. I, I like the interaction, so. Okay. <clears throat> um, here is, I'll give you one more example. Again, you cannot really read it, it's too small, but I'll, then I'll share the PDF, by the way, of all the slides, so you, you have them. Um, so here is uh, IARC monograph. So what is IARC? IARC is the International Agency of Research, of research on Cancer, and it's basically the uh, cancer research organization for uh, the World Health Organization, okay? So WHO for cancer, that's the agency that takes care of that research. Basically, the most important institution in, in, for cancer research, uh, you know, WHO has, uh, the, the we have, <clears throat> in, at least in some sense. Um, so as you can see, for every organ, uh, there is an arrow and a list of carcinogens and exposures and environmental factors, okay? Um, so again, the same type of picture. Um, here, another example. This is a, an important publication in the United States <clears throat> every year reporting you know, data on cancer. <clears throat> and I don't know if you can read, but it says that essentially there are two factors, hereditary factors and environmental factors. Okay, so again, H and E. And in fact, not just that, but they give a number, which is the environmental factors as opposed to related factors account for an estimated 75 to 80% of cancer cases, okay? So they, they give you also an estimate of what they think is, is the proportion of the two. And by the way, just to, to clear uh, from the beginning, it is actually well known as of today that hereditary factors don't account for a lot of cancer, right? So it can be very important, if it's present in a family, but when you look overall in the population at the total number of cancer cases, the proportion of cancer cases that as of today we can assign to an hereditary factor is actually relatively small, okay? I estimated five to 10% or so. Yes? Can I just repeat, so does hereditary factor mean, you know, something that you are born with and then independently of what happens in the environment, you'll get it? I mean, you know, even if the environment were as best as we can make it, you'd get the cancer? Or, you know, is it something that you have and then the environment hits you and you, you get the cancer, while somebody without it could have it? So. Okay, like, fantastic question, okay? And in fact, this reminds me that I should have had one more slide, because that's exactly why you asked that question, which is, how do we get to cancer, all right? And now you just get... Tomazetti's version of that answer, which hopefully it's somewhat close to the truth, which is that uh, cancer is complicated, right? But I would say as of today, it's, I think it's agreed upon that the main engine of what takes an healthy tissue to become cancer is uh, mutational events, where for mutations, we don't necessarily mean DNA mutations, it could be epigenetics, okay? But mutational events, and, and a series of them that takes a person to cancer. And uh, we call those mutations, and tomorrow, I, I have it for tomorrow, but I probably should have introduced it today anyway. Um, and we call these mutations that drive cancer drivers because they are driving the car, okay? They are driving the process, contrary to all other mutations that we call passengers. And as I said, um, <clears throat> depending on cancer type and depending on, you know, there are multiple pathways that take, can take you to cancer, a typical, a rough estimation that I typically use is that you need three in solid tumors often, uh, liquid tumors, it's less, usually two, but there are cases where one is sufficient, but it's by far the exception, okay? Very few I know of where one event is sufficient. So to answer your question, right, if you are born with an internet mutation, you have now, have, if, you, if you need three hits to get to cancer, you now have the first one of those three in every cell of your body. 
because every cell of your body contains the mutation because it comes from your parents, right? <clears throat> Versus when a mutation happens, we call it somatic if it's new, it's not germline. When it's not uh, inherited, at the beginning at least, you get it in one cell of your whole body, right? So yes, uh, did, did I answer? Okay. But so, so yeah, so keep in mind that you need multiple events to, to get there in general. And, and, and to finish actually, to be very clear on when here they say, say 80% is due to the environment, what they mean is that at least one of those events was due to the environment, okay? And the logic is what? The logic is that if I could remove that one mutation that the environment caused, this person would not have cancer. It's not, you know, there's no mathematical way to define things because, of course, you can imagine that the person still gets uh, due to something else later on in life, right? But if you stop at the very moment where the third mutation hit and one of those three was due to the environment, that person would not have cancer if the environment was not part of the equation, right? Make sense? So that's what is meant. Even one, yes. Oh, do I need to turn it on or it's on? Yeah. Oh, because this, okay, yeah, I think, no, it's uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, where do you classify viral infections here? Because they change the genome often, but they're not uh, inherited in that sense. Right, so viral infections, uh, if it's an infection, so if you get an infection, that's an environmental factor. Okay. Yeah. As a okay. as a yeah. classification, yeah. And you know, we can maybe leave it like this, and, yeah, just like that. Okay. Um. All right, that's great. I like this. Please let's keep going this way. I I love it with questions like this, and these are all great questions. So. Okay. So, uh, by the way, I'm telling all of this because this is how this happened. This research happened, and I want you to. So as a PhD, one thing that I felt when I was a PhD, it feels a little bit overwhelming. You are, you know, just learning a new field. And it's like, how can I possibly have any type of impact, you know, if not only after 20 years of research? And one good news I would like to bring to, and you, you may already be very well aware, so forgive me if, if you already know all of this, but I often I see students that don't know this, which is, Today we are in a, in, you know, in a, at a time where a lot of um, science, uh, and in particular medicine and biology, you know, things have become so quantitative that in many cases uh, the ones that have these quantitative tools, like the ones you are learning right now, are the first ones to see a new or understand for the first time a new phenomenon. Okay, so I always like to say. Um, when we think about medicine, for example, okay, do you know where modern medicine was born? This is not me saying it. This is actually the, if you look at the, uh, um, it's Oxford, actually. I don't remember the exact text, but it's, you know, the University of Oxford, history of medicine, modern medicine, uh, which was born with pathology, really. So if you want to be very specific, modern pathology, do you know where it was born? It was born in Italy and uh, in Padova uh, and, and Bologna, where for the first time, this was Renaissance times, someone decided to take a dead body and cut it open. And they said, enough with just trusting Galenus and Aristoteles ideas and uh, hoping the animals that we observe that have exactly the organ shape that the humans have, right? Let's actually look at the human body. Well, that brought a description of the organs in the human body that we had no idea before, right? So that's when you make progress in science, in my opinion. One major, you know, if we're thinking about mathematics, okay, math, a lot of it can just happen in, in our brain, like right? some, some person very smart thinks about something really great. But <clears throat> in medicine, for example, often it's about observing something that you couldn't observe before that makes you realize, you know, understand better the phenomenon. So that happened in Renaissance. 
Then of course we got microscopes. So that now, instead of just understanding the shape and try to guess the function of an organ, right? Now we can see all the way down to basically a cell level, right? And then in, in the year 2000, with the you know, with human genome being sequenced, that's been kind of like the third evolution in medicine, right? Where now we can look inside the DNA of a single cell and, and infer the behavior of the cell, what that cell is doing, okay? In fact, sometimes even dynamically, based on, on this information. So, so, and every time you add one of the scientific revolutions, you have a major improvement in how you understand medicine, right? And so here, um, the ability, uh, today a lot of medicine has become, you know, letters of DNA or things that are objects that are complex, where you need tools like machine learning to understand the behavior of, of you know, the system. So it's, it's a great time, as, as I'm sure you obviously already know, to be in this field. But I'm, I'm telling you this story because um, I think... I think it's very important that um, you know that, that you understand that there's no field where um, um, people like quantitative people are just serving the field. Like I don't know. Let me give you one more example. Um, where I work, where I work right now, for example, which is basically a cancer center with a graduate school. Um, the majority of the quantitative people until a few years ago, were statisticians, they were crunching the numbers for doctors, okay? So you had a famous MD, a medical you know, doctor, running a clinical trial, and for the clinical trial, they need to do some power calculation to know how many patients they need in the trial. So they call the statistician, and they say, please run me this power calculation, okay? And that was the role. That's not what is medicine today many times is now the quantitative person that's informing the MD about what is actually happening because you cannot see it with, with your eyes, right? Okay, so again, here's how it happened in this case. So I was, I was interested in this topic and, uh, and I was reading this and uh, I'll give you one more example because I think it's really uh, striking. So here is Harvard. So Harvard Epidemiology for the United States is the most important department of epidemiology. And uh, they, had, they had a meeting. It, it's not anymore on their website. Uh, I had to use Wayback Machine. But they had a meeting <coughs> where essentially in, in 96, where essentially uh, you know, this uh, um, wrote a report on cancer prevention uh, where essentially they had the they had a conference with the, the specialists, uh, epidemiologists of the time, uh, to gather, as it says there, right, the best evidence, uh, best epidemiological research they had on what causes cancer, and then write a review and a consensus statement. Okay, consensus statement means everyone pretty much agrees that this is important. Okay, and with that conference, there was, uh, you know, a paper came out, which is, you see a table on the right, where causes of cancer, <clears throat> these were the, essentially the, the estimates for the various causes, okay? And um, now, when you look at that um, carefully, uh, well, first of all, it's again, what I was telling you, all environmental lifestyle factors and some inherited, right? Mm -hmm. But when you look at it carefully, <clears throat> So they have this statement, nearly two thirds of cancer deaths in the United States can be linked to just the first three lines in that table, okay? You know, when a person, when a normal person reads this, says, wow, uh, so if I don't smoke, I'm obese and I exercise, I'm already, I, I shouldn't be in two thirds of the population that gets cancer, right? And in fact, they even had a 10 commandments page. Basically, do these 10 things, you will not get cancer. Okay, what is striking, and you obviously appreciate this, is when you put all those numbers together, you get 200%, okay? So obviously, this cannot be true, right? Because 
I'm, then I'm not allowed to be obese and smoke at the same time, right? So, but look at, look at the conclusion. This is the conclusion of the consensus statement. This is the top scientist in the world on cancer etiology, okay? One of the most important conclusions to be drawn from this report is that cancer is indeed a preventable illness, okay? Okay. So, all right. I hope I convinced you that that was, that was what everyone thought. Again, this is all the way to 2014-15. Now, there were some uh, interesting contradictions to what I just told you. For example, Michael Bishop, who is a Nobel Prize, um, I recommend you, if you have not watched, there is this beautiful documentary. So there is this book called Emperor of All uh, Maladies on Cancer. It's a very big book. Few actually read it through. I, I haven't read it through. But uh, it's, it's informative. And they made a documentary. It's a six hours documentary. And he says the sentence in that documentary, which came out uh, literally a few months before the paper that I published that show. And he says, very honestly, actually, we have no idea about pretty much two thirds of the cancer cases, the, the, the cause of those cancers. And in fact, they use in that documentary a crab, which is a symbol for cancer, and they shade, you know, two thirds of that crab to indicate that for two thirds, we don't really know the causes. <clears throat> and so what was interesting is that if you, if I looked at Cancer Research UK in 2014, for example, it was saying 42% is due to the environment. So, you know, I was like, wait a second. So on one side, the numbers say that's 42% due to the environment and maybe five to 10% due to inherited. But on the other side, I, I read these statements where it sounds like you're saying that it's obviously all the environment or, you know, I, I couldn't put the two things together. So I became very interested in understanding this, what I, what I thought was to me a contradiction. And uh, so I thought there was something missing. And uh, so, and I'll, I'll talk about this um, tomorrow. So I, I, won't, I won't really, I have done some little modeling work where um, there, there was some evidence, at least to me and to those that accepted to publish this paper, that um, um, our bodies accumulate normally a lot of mutations. And it was kind of unexpected. Let me just give you a picture of, of the idea. So before the paper, the idea, but even like really the idea in the field was that if you think about time, the green, the you know, the green, I guess it's a triangle if you saw what is under um, the other two, uh, representing in time the accumulation of these normal mutations, it's very small, okay? So the idea was that when I look at the cancer in a patient and I do the sequencing and I find 100 mutations, almost all of those mutations were caused by the cancer process, okay? And what, and I'll tell you tomorrow about this more, but what I thought I found evidence for was actually a lot of the mutations of those hundred mutations that we found in, in the cancer of that patient would have been there even without the cancer, okay? And so this was a bit surprising. So that, you know, if you reverse it, that those are, so this was a bit surprising at the time, it was unexpected. But so what that meant to me is that this, uh, what I call the background mutation rate. So the fact that, when cells divide normally, they accumulate mutations. Why? Because it's a living, the cell is a living system and nothing is perfect, right? There is not, nothing that's error proof. And so we estimate about three to six mutations are accumulated on the DNA every time a cell divides and has to copy the DNA. By the way, I didn't score, this is very well known. But because it's, you know, it's only three letters out of three billions, the thought was, so what? You know, this is irrelevant for cancer. And, and uh, I thought, well, you know, um, oh, this is something that I actually used to explain the concept, <clears throat> but I think probably I don't need it for you. But essentially, let me just, on the, I wanted to show the lower right because I, I always, I'm always asked that. So imagine that you can be born or not with a, an inherited mutation, which is the blue in the, in the figure in the bottom right. And then in time, we accumulate with regularity <clears throat> these mutations. They are normal. Nothing, you know, 
We are not, it's not because we are smoking, just they are accumulating hormone. And then of course, if we expose our bodies to environmental exposures, then we accumulate more, which is the green dots, okay? So I call this normal uh, replicative mutations, the R factor for replicative mutations, okay? And so the question is how important as, are these replicative mutations? Because everyone thought that they, they were not important at all. So, and here I'll show you just a little model. And the idea was, well, okay, uh, how about, um, you know, let's think about this. And, and again, look how simple, this is almost embarrassingly simple, okay? The idea is the following. <clears throat> mutations happen, or these are mutations happen when a cell divide. So how many of these mutations I get in an organ, it's mainly function of two things. How many cells that organ has, because the more cells, you know, a big organ will have more mutations, right? And how often those cells divide, okay? So, and tomorrow I'll show you that obviously this formula is quite wrong, but if you just roughly said, well, let's just consider the product of, of D, which is the division frequency of the cells and N, which is the number of cells that I have in an organ and stem cells for those that know biology, I think they will understand why specifically stem cells, <clears throat> but skip it here. So, you know, what about considering this product and now looking at many, many different tissues. If these are mutations are important, I should see kind of like a dose response, right? I should see that the more divisions and the more cells, the more cancer in a given organ. By the way, before, another, another surprising thing is, before this paper, if you asked any doctor why there is more colorectal cancer than, um, I don't know, bone cancer, there was no answer. The answer was, the answer would have been, Probably it has something to do with the environment. For example, lung cancer is, you know, the most common cancer type. Well, because of smoking, okay? Okay, well, so that's exactly what, what I tested. I, I, I essentially, not exactly the product that I showed you there, but essentially I look at, at that product and on the x-axis, that's the value of that product, okay? And so we have different organs. And on the y-axis, I looked at the cancer risk in those organs. Okay, and, and, this, and this figure up, appeared and where the Spearman correlation, right? <clears throat> For the biological phenomena, I, and it's a very high value, okay, 0.8. Um, and I didn't put the p-value, but it was like, you know, I don't know, to the negative eight or something like that. And so, while of course this doesn't wants to be the full explanation, um, you know this is across many orders of magnitude, and and um, we did some sensitivity analysis to show that you know even if we had some estimates wrong for how many cells in an organ, the results will stay. Uh, that didn't really change. By the way, who can tell me? Um, so one of the criticisms immediately after this paper came out was, oh, but you're using estimated on how many cells you have in a tissue and how often they divide. How sure are you that they are correct? And depending on that, you know, your result may be totally wrong. Well, they didn't read the supplementary file where we show with sensitivity and that that was not the case. We, we allow for two orders of money for each point to be two orders of magnitude to the left or to the right in terms of x, the x value, okay? The result state. Why is that? I don't think you need to do that analysis to know that that would be the case. <clears throat> well, that was the whole point of this analysis is when you put a lot of points together, right? As long as this estimate, first of all, it's in, order, in logs. So here, you know, as long as you get the right order of magnitude, you are probably pretty good, in pretty good shape. But also when you put 30 points together, even if you are off on some points, right? It's going to be a little bit hard that you're going to be wrong in all points in the wrong direction to cancel the true signal, right? 
basically that's the point here i'm not looking at the estimate of one value i'm just trying to understand if there is a signal across all of them together i'm just looking for a correlation right for an, an association of course if i want, want to measure the specific risk uh, if i want to do any inference of one point then yes i'm super sensitive to my estimations of what the number of cells are for that tissue right but if i'm looking at, at all together the analysis is, becomes a lot more robust yeah please Your, i think they want you to use the microphone yeah, i think okay. yeah. yeah if you push it up i think it becomes green yeah, that there, there. on the top on the top no okay so if so if one had an alternative hypothesis that for instance that these cancers were due to environmental factors um uh then wouldn't you also expect that the bigger tissues would have more cancer simply because each cell has some fixed probability of you know being hit by an environmental factor and therefore the bigger you are the more likely you, you are so right so again a fantastic question you, you have great questions um you could and so we did an analysis in that paper actually in the 2017 you you can find the results where uh we look at the effect of the environment across tissues and, and we show that there is no correlation in fact almost a little bit inverse correlation but you know why because for example the most environmentally affected cancer well in terms of number of cases is lung cancer okay in terms of uh, cancer proportion of cancer cases is cervical cancer cervical cancer is viral infection that's it hpv you get cervical cancer i mean a proportion of them get cervical cancer but so both of those for it, but especially lung it's right in the middle in terms of number of cells you see so the point is environmental exposures are going to affect tissues they don't care if it's a big organ or small yes that is part of the equation but if a, if a tissue is more internal or less exposed you know it's not like the intestine for example then uh you may not get as much of an effect as for others so the point of including all of these different tissues together is also to in a sense averaging out the effects of different uh, exposures and yes, so and even when you look at them all together, uh, as I said, we show we show the um, for for example, we provided two analyses to answer that question that you asked, and one was with Hiroshima, right? So there, uh, atomic bomb survivors. Then you would think, right? These are, I mean, radiation went through them, hit every organ the same way. Then you should see that definitely not the case. Okay, but sorry. I mean, if I read correctly, you have that the, the smokers have a two orders of magnitude more risk. Correct. So, yeah. So the aspect of environment is huge. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, right. uh, yeah. yes. So it's not saying that the environment doesn't do anything. Absolutely not. Absolutely, absolutely not. Yeah. And in fact, um, uh, we put that on purpose so to show that that was the difference, right? The, the environment, and there are a few other cases. But the point is, <clears throat> in fact. From this slide, from this analysis, you cannot infer really what is the role of R. If you understand statistics, you understand that there is something going on that's important. But you know, this is just an association. Um, I'm not saying that if I run a regression line, for example, that would be the true value, right? There is a lot of noise. And uh, in fact, I'll, I'll show you tomorrow that the picture is more complicated than this. But basically, <clears throat> this says that um, that uh, with the spiral correlation of 0.8, right? When you take the square of that, uh, then you get that about two thirds of the variation on the y-axis can be explained by the variation on the x-axis. Okay, so two thirds it's a, it's a pretty good chunk of the explanation. But of course, there is a lot that it's to you know we know that the environment is fundamental. Mm -hmm. So then that, um, okay, let me, let me just digress a, a little bit more on this. Um, again, I, I want to use this kind of like a, for, for today, kind of like a, a case study to show sometimes how things work in research. 
<clears throat> so, so that figure became a paper in, in science. And uh, 10 days later, WHO, which I just told you, the most important organization in the world, basically comes out with a press release number 231. For the very first time in their history, for all I can tell, I went back. They, I don't have access to the first 50 of the press releases, but for the first time against the scientific publication. Okay, When they basically, uh, you read the at the bottom, they strongly disagreed with my conclusions and Dr. Bogost in the other quarter. Okay. And you know, I jokingly say, but at that time I wasn't so jokingly that I thought my career was over, right? Because I was a brand new assistant professor. And here's WHO saying very officially that I was clearly wrong. Okay. Uh, so um, so then what happened? I'll tell you. The, the, I'll answer the two main criticisms because that way we can stay here for a day. Uh, one criticism was that in their original analysis, breast and, and prostate cancer were not included. And initially I didn't because those are you know, affected by hormonal levels. So when I look at how many cells and how often they divide, I approximate by assuming like kind of like, you know, a constant rate through life. And things that are affected by hormonal like cycles and things like that are definitely not constant. So I felt it was a bit more complicated to model. But we did it later in 2017 when we answered to WHO and we showed the infect breast and prostate didn't, didn't change uh, the result. But their main criticism really wasn't that. The main criticism was, as and here again, it's what they said, that I did analysis in United States. And if I did it in another country, the results would have been very different. Well, they say different. <clears throat> um, and why they said that? By the way, I'm saying all of this because I, 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 I'm hoping that um, since we are going to spend all this time together, I'm hoping that one of the things that um, you know, you'll be left with is some a bit more understanding of, of the biological issues behind this topic, and maybe even some excitement about this, this field. So the reason why they were saying that is the following map. Okay, this map is the poster boy of cancer epidemiology, okay? And what I mean for that is that anytime you hear, I, if you go to a talk of, of a you know, scientist, especially from WHO, uh, by epidemiologists in general. Epidemiologists are those that study, well, cancer epidemiologists are those that study what causes cancer. They will tell you, look at the world map. Well, there's clearly enormous variation. So it must be the environment. Okay. Now, one interesting thing about this map is, well, as you can see, the countries that have the most cancer are like Western countries and you know, Australia versus on the other side, it's Africa, the lowest and, and India and so on. Uh, so by the way, one thing that's interesting, when we talk about the environment, okay? Um, as I told you, when we call environmental factors, we talk about external exposures. So pollution and asbestos and all of that and lifestyle. So for external exposures, what would be your guess? Are, you know, say, is the United States more polluted than Africa or less polluted? What would you say? Yeah. So I'm talking about pollution in terms of, you know, what as people we get exposed to. And you know why? Because, you know, when I think about Africa, I think about, you know, the savanna and the clear sky. I mean, but the reality is that, you know, no matter which of those countries, usually people tend to live in very big metropolitan areas. And for example, if the regulation on the type of gas that you can use for your car or what a factory can shoot out of their chimneys, you know, if those regulations are not strict, 
right? The people right there are exposed to stuff that where there are regulations, they are not. So there are indices, and actually these are analysis. Uh, there is a very nice study, a Yale study. You can just Google it, you find it. Data set right, right, ready to be analyzed uh, with indices for all kinds of, um, you know, uh, environmental factors indicators. So air pollution, you know, particulate, uh, water quality, blah, 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 blah. No matter which one you look at, I think except for one, and I don't remember which one, but you know, it's like four of them. <clears throat> it's the opposite of this map. So, you know, at some point I even thought it would have been funny to publish a paper where I say, well, the, 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 the environment is inversely correlated to cancer. So I guess go out and get some, you know, smog, some pollution because it must be protective, right? Which obviously is nonsense. By the way, this is a great example of the risk that we have in doing machine learning, right? Or whatever field is like <clears throat> that. If you don't really understand the problem, it's very easy to just grab data and come out with conclusions that are utter nonsense, right? Because obviously it's not that I believe the pollution is not harmful, right? But the fact is that I believe the external environment, so pollution, is as a very little impact in terms of cancer cases, right? So um, that is not really for what we know today, especially in Western society where we have better data, um, the major source of cancer, okay? In fact, let me show you. So, so that's what they said. So now you understand that <clears throat> this is how Today, still today, in many ways, cancer is justified as an environmental uh, cause, uh, you know, uh, disease. And now I'll show you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Please. Just, I think, yeah, to wait. Uh, there is a line. Yeah. Okay. So, because we saw this mm, map also the other day in another talk. And I wonder also if, um, like, we have this kind of uh, uh, division between uh, of uh, incidency of cancer, also because in some countries there is underdiagnosis of cancer. Because, yeah, uh, uh, the perfect answer. So, where uh, where did you hear? Where did you see this map before? Uh, last week, uh, the the. First lecture, I think, from okay. uh, oh, so yeah. in this very corner. Okay, yeah, perfect, yeah. perfect, perfect. <laughs> okay, so that's great. Yeah, it's a it's a very well known and, and used map, right? So, okay, let me show you to answer your question. Let me show you something that we are about to publish. I mean, about to submit. But it's a very simple thing. So the map on the top there is the same map I just showed you. I just changed the colors because the R software that we had was that default. Okay. Now, the second map, though, is data quality. By the way, I should say one second. Sorry, let me go back. WHO criticized my result because they said, obviously, if you do it in other countries where cancer is all different, your correlations are going to be all scrambled, right? Again, if you really think deeply about it, not at all. In fact, even before looking at the data, I knew they were wrong. I was actually very surprised because these are people that are epidemiologists, you know, pretty good background in statistics, even though they are usually not statisticians or mathematicians. And it shows in this case because when you look at the, so, okay, so data quality, that's a second map, right? So the third is just one possible normalization, okay, which I'm not claiming is, is the right one, but one way to correct for data quality, okay? So look, <clears throat> Italy um, is, I think, A quality, top quality, right? United States and many countries are, and some are. So uh, as you can see there, by the way, this data quality score is provided by WHO. So it's their score, okay? So I just took their score and I look at the results. So now you can all understand that we are not claiming that there are no differences, but you cannot just show that map and not mention what you just mentioned, which is, but what about data quality, right? And look, I'm, I'm in it, you know, I, I, I was born in Trieste. I, you know, it's where I did my bachelor and uh, my mother is from Southern Italy, okay? 
um, which I, I love Southern Italy. But, you know, some people who pay so that the doctor doesn't record that their father or mother die of this type of cancer because they don't want their neighbor to know. You know, you know let me, I'm talking about like anti Samir ago, okay? Things are improving everywhere. But the point is, even in countries that are considered really high quality data countries, there is still a lot to improve. You can only imagine, right? Uh, what, when you look across the whole world, how much progress needs to be done there. Anyway, this is a <clears throat> this is just uh, to say that. So then we went and uh, yes. It's already ready. It's just yeah. I, oh, it was clean. I thought. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that is. Uh... Another factor that may be play a crucial role is the lifetime. So in many countries, the, uh, yes. the lifetime is much lower than in others. So you have less probability to accumulate a lot of mutations, let's say in this way. So this yeah. is also another- So the, again, great question. They, okay. Epidemiologists are no mathematicians, but they do correct for age. They control for that. Even though, <clears throat> you know, what is the problem? That when you look at the age group 70 to 80, we're saying a country have a lot less people than in another country. In a sense, you are biasing the population because those that in a country where everyone dies at 40 and they are 80, there must be something special about those people. Those are not normal 70 to 80 year old, right? In any case, no, they, they do try to control for that in general. But yes, that's that's a good point. Otherwise, also that would be a major factor. Okay, so we look at the data, analyze the data. Yes, please. No, no, that's this this perfect. The more questions, the the better the, the lecture. Please. I think it's just a matter of seconds and it will become green. Maybe I shouldn't plug it in. Maybe I'll just leave it out so the because I think he reset it. Still nothing. Uh, the top. Okay. Okay. Uh, so it's not really a question of saying that environment is not a factor, right. but it's not the only factor, I guess. Perfect. Yeah. 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 Let me let me say because some of the media when the paper came out, you know they. Well, some of those that criticized my paper said, this paper is very dangerous because now people are going to be, go back and drink and smoke, right? And obviously we, we don't want that. And I don't think people are stupid, honestly, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the environment, it has a tremendous impact on, on cancer. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, the number of cell divisions and lifespan and factors like this are so important because of the replicative mutations. Um, it should also have implications for uh, iPSCs where people use stem cells like differentiated cells and convert them to stem cells to make organs for transplants because those have lived a lot of cell divisions and are then become becoming a cell a stem cell again. And then the number of replicative mutations in them will be much higher. Do you think it has a risk for iPSC derived organ transplants? Like, will those organs develop uh, cancer at a higher rate? Might they? Yes. Ask some question. The answer is yes. I, I think so. I don't think anyone studied it, but you can study it. But, um, you know, for example, um, a study I wanted to do, and I, but I didn't have the data when I was a postdoc. And then two years ago, I saw a paper on it, was. Um, the older is the father of a child, the more mutations the child has at birth. And why is that? It's because the germ cell that produces the sperm, right, keep dividing, going through cycles, right? So 10 years later, a man in his, in his germ cells will have more mutations than, than 10 years earlier. And so, you know, the second, third, fourth child will have a lot more mutations, so my, you know, uh, general mutations then. So yes, this, 
the cell division, you have always to think about it and how it, it works. And this is something that we, Sophie, we do, you know, we think a lot about that. Uh, and I'll tell you more tomorrow. Okay, so, yes. And now it's already green. Yeah, yeah so, I like, um, the incidence of cancer has also increased over, like, uh, long periods of time. Oh, wow, that's another and good question, yes. Yeah, so I think a, like a, a popular debate is that lifespan of man has increased, so there's there's more sample space. Uh, but do you think this might also be a factor because of the thing you said about germ cells getting more mutations? So uh, over generations. Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, just to repeat your question, she's asking about um, is, when you look at historical data, cancer incidence has gone up. Except for say lungs, lung cancer has gone down because people are, you know, stopping to smoke, at least some some people are. Uh, but in general, it's gone up. And why is that? And you know, you would think the number of cells doesn't really change much, but if you're looking at absolute numbers, this is a population that lives a lot all, you know, longer than 30 years ago. But it's gone up even when you control for age. So if, if we look at within the same age interval, you will see that's gone up. But there I would claim a major factor is that we do better screening and do we record better who has cancer, okay? Uh, eight years ago, many died of cancer without knowing, right? And I think you're familiar, you may have heard, like they recently did this study, I think in Russia, but some Eastern country, I don't remember, where you know they looked at men, and basically every man that at 80 or whatever age essentially has prostate cancer, whether it was diagnosed or not, okay? It's just a normal process that pretty much every man goes through, right? So, okay, I hope I... Okay, so, so we did an analysis in 2017 to answer those criticisms and we show, actually this is a very nice test set, right? Because I didn't even, know of their existence. Well, I probably imagine there was some cancer registry data of other places in the world, but I didn't even, you know, worry about it at that time. So then we got we get criticized. So then this data sets from 69 countries come and now we have to run this analysis for each one of them, right? These are 69 independent data sets we've never seen before. Is the result going to hold? And the result in fact, you know, one thing I was not happy is that when you look at the overall the median value, or yeah, I think it was the median, was exactly the same number, 0.8, that we had in the original paper, right? I wanted to be a bit different because I thought, these guys are going to think that I cheated, right? Uh, in reality, the analysis is so simple that you can do it yourself and, you know, there is no cheating, it's their data, and it's a correlation, right? Okay, so... Uh, by the way, this is also to show you how much of a reaction you can cause with just a correlation analysis, okay? So don't think you have to do anything particularly sophisticated to publish in science or to do something that may have consequences in the field. Uh, it's more about the question you're asking and what, what is the answer that you're finding, okay? More than the methodology. Okay, um, maybe I'll skip this one in the interest of time. Uh, well, let me see. Let me, let me just say that this is another criticism. Maybe I'll just mention one thing about this paper and then I'm happy to, you know, but essentially here we answer to another criticism where some people thought that you could assess cancer risk by drawing a regression line in the middle and say, actually this is relevant because of, again, machine learning and being quantitative. So you can, this, this also, I think, teaches something. So the idea was, by the way, I had this idea before publishing my own paper, but I thought it was not a good idea. And, and I'll tell you why. So say you run a regression line, right? There is clearly some important correlation. You can run a regression line. Everyone does that, okay? And then if you take the bottom tissues, they create, you know, you, you have this uh, envelope, right? The lower. Uh, here, this red line here. Now you can say, well, okay, let's say Tomazetti is right and there is indeed this R factor that's important in some cancer types. Mm -hmm. Let's say there is, there is due to that. And now I measure from there up, okay? 
and the proportion of what is the actual risk versus what should have been just due to R tells me how much is R, how much is the environment, and I do this. And I do this for the tissue at the time, right? What is the problem of that? The problem of that is that you are going to depend very heavily on the value of the point, right? Because there, there you do rely, there, the analysis is for one point at a time. So there you really rely on the estimates, first of all. And second of all, I never thought that you could use something on over five orders of magnitude in log scale to estimate the risk of a tissue, okay? Um, like there is too much noise. So for example, so I'll go very quickly. For example, if you, if you do the opposite. So when we ask, we say, okay, let's do the opposite game. But by the way, very not simple. They never define, not simple to define what this line should be, which point you pick to define your lowest line here. Right? What is the boundary? So I, we define a rule and, and we said, now we play the opposite game. So now we say that when it's the upper envelope here, it's basically all due to an environment. And now we go down, right? So now the, if you use this one, you say everything is the environment. If you use this one, you say everything is R. Okay, so no very conclusive way to approach, the, you know, to give an answer. Um, in fact, we showed, and you can find the details. Sorry, at that point it was submitted, but it's been published in 2018. Um, we, sh we showed that uh, the approach of, of finding, you know, we showed that even if, even if the truth was this green line, so a perfect regression line, which I never believed would be the case, but even if that was the case, so, it, you know, all due to R. So basically the factor that we, uh, discovered. And then you just scramble it with some noise and the green points become red. And then you use this lower line and you measure. We show that essentially, no matter what the truth is, you know, I put an arrow here, but it could have been anywhere. Essentially, you know, we, we simulated, I don't remember, 10,000 times. Essentially, you would always say that 90% is due to the environment. Okay. It's, it's flawed by default. It's not a way that you can assess the, the question. So, okay, uh, in that paper, we also provided, and I'll conclude with this part, you, we also provided a proportion. If you look at uh, the number of mutations that you find in cancers, can we assign over all cancer types, how many can be attributed to inheritor factors, to environmental factors, and to R factors? And the answer was quite shocking, actually, which was that two thirds was uh, attributable to R. Okay, and we provide a, a lower bound too, uh, a very conservative lower bound. And, and again, I'm happy to talk about any of this. So in the conclusion of this part is that with the simple regret, um, no even regression correlation, okay, um, we, we brought to the attention of the field uh, the role, you know, the, the major role that these normally occurring mutations have in cancer possession. Um, and, and later, you know, by now, this is, uh, I would say, very well accepted. Um, uh, here is something I've been asked to write where I was reporting on research that was not mine anymore at that point, just the Broad Institute, which is the biggest sequencing center in the United States, and Sanger Institute in England finding that, yes, indeed, our tissues are full, normally full of mutations and some dangerous ones. WHO now has a section in their book reporting on this, uh, you know, with their uh, Harvard epidemiology, uh, wrote a consensus paper with us where now basically everyone agrees that there are indeed three factors that yield cancer. And in fact, the one that's essentially always sure is this R factor, okay? Okay, so let me spend the last 20 minutes on, uh, I'll promise you tomorrow I'll be, I'll be because I, I hate to go over time, so. And I know I'm the last one, so you may hope I finish earlier than later, so. Uh, and maybe I'll have to finish some of this tomorrow, but uh, uh, I'm happy, I think it was important to, to you know, have a, a basic understanding of, of the problem. So 
as I told you, that, that is just uh, what I showed you until now uh, is just to assess through a correlation and, and another part I didn't show you through the estimation of proportion mutations, what is due to these three different factors. One way to do it is using uh, what is called uh, mutational signatures, okay? And today I would claim that there is almost no paper in genomics analysis when there is sequencing, you know, say sequencing in the data that does not also put a mutational signature analysis in the paper. Otherwise, probably the reviewer will ask them, you know, have you run also a mutational signature analysis? And the paper that started all of this is an actual paper in 2013, where, you know, they come up with, uh, here you see uh, about 21, but there are a few more in the supplement, but you see this mutation of signatures. So what are these mutation of signatures? So I, I love the fact that with you, it's very easy to explain it because, um, so um, think about the mutations in DNA, okay? You know the C is paired with G, right? And T with A. So you can reduce all major mutation types. If you're just looking at base that's mutated to six, okay? C to A, C to G, C to T, or T to A, T to C, or T to G. And that's the symbol to say that you go from a C to an A, okay? So that's a point mutation. So one base, one nucleotide in the genome, in the DNA that's changed. Okay, so what is a mutational signature? A mutational signature is just, if you want, a probability distribution over this, all the, mutation, all, all the possible mutation types, where instead of just, I mean, here I told you about the six, but in reality, if you consider, the flanking bases, so the bases they are on the side of the mutation, right before and right after, okay? So you get a triplet. If you consider all the possible combination of triplets, there are 96 of them, okay? That's, that's easy to show that. So now you have 96 possibilities, and you are just asking what is the probability distribution of each one of them, okay? And basically the idea, the way to think about this is, Think I'm a cell that I'm about to divide and smoking is really bothering me and I'm trying to copy the DNA and it's causing me to make a mistake. What is the probability that I make a, spurt, a certain mistake, you know? So is it going to be a C becoming a T or a C becoming an A and, and so on, right? So this is, the idea is that a mutational process has a favorite way to induce mutations, which can be represented by a probability distribution over the space of all possible mutation types. Is, is that clear? Ask me if you don't understand, because this is a, you know, the only uh, point I think it's important to understand for mutation signatures. And this is for all mutations, or just for the ones that are linked to causing of the cancer? This is, this is for all mutations, yeah. yeah. And so the idea is, can we find what smoking likes to cause and what alcohol likes to cause and so on, okay? So these are called mutational signatures. It's like smoking likes to leave a signature of how it causes mutations you know, in, in DNA and so on. Okay, so in this paper, what they used is non-negative matrix factorization. Now, I don't know if you are familiar or not, um, but it's very simple, right? So non-negative matrix, it, it, the word itself says it basically, because you have a matrix, your original matrix is the V matrix there, right? So you have a matrix and it's non-negative. So the entries can be zero or positive, but they can't be negative. So in this, in our case, think about the entries are the mutation counts. How many mutations on the DNA of this person were C's that became T's, right? Uh, I count 15 of them. Okay, 15 for that entry. And then two of this other type and so on, right? So that's the original matrix. And what NMF does, it's an unsupervised methodology. So, you know, I'm assuming some of you probably know about it, some never heard before, but it's a, it's a methodology where you basically take the original matrix and you factor that matrix in two, okay? And depending on which field you are, you know, you may have heard about the loading matrix and, you know, it, it depends on the field, but often it's feature and coefficient, okay? And 
essentially you come up with two non-negative matrices. And of course, there is some leftover, like the error, like, like in regression, right? You have some noise left and you try to minimize the error. You try to have that these two matrices are as close as possible to your, your original when you do the product of them. And of course, you can do it using right different type of me, you know, measuring error in different metrics, using different metrics, okay? So that's the idea, but let me show you uh, the intuition um, behind is, so this is, for example, let's, let's forget the 96 types for now, for simplicity, let's say we look at the six major ones, okay? So C, they become A, C become Gs and so on. And how many of them I have? This is say a specific path cancer patient. Well, what, not, what this uh, NMF does is, is going to split in two matrices where on one side, the columns are signatures. Uh, I'll tell you a bit more in a sec. And on the other side, and, and the other matrix contains the intensities of those signatures. So basically, uh, I told you what a signature is, a, dis a probability distribution, right? A, a pattern that a certain carcinogen likes to cause. And the other matrix is how intense is the signature in that given patient, right? So I see a lot of smoking in this patient, not so much alcohol, and this patient is old, I see a lot of aging, and so on. It, it doesn't make sense? Okay. This is just to, to provide the intuition behind the approach. Okay. So that's what they use, NMF. <clears throat> now, um, I, I was interested in this approach. Now I think you understand that I've been seeing what I did before because I'm interested in what causes cancer. And, <clears throat> but I noticed that there were some problems. And for example, uh, when you look at liver cancer, um, each rectangle here, it's one patient, okay? And the height is the number of mutation, total number of mutations found in that patient. And the colors are the proportion of the total. They are due to a specific signature. And remember that in this framework, a signature is a specific mutational process, okay? It could be smoking, it could be. And because it's an MF, I'm not, right? There is no learning, like, uh, like it just unlabeled, right? It's, yeah. So I, I, I don't tell an MF, this guy was a smoker. I'm just splitting, using many patients, um, you know, uh, asking for signatures, and this is what I get. Okay, so one problem is signature one B is aging, <clears throat> so everyone has some age. Okay, that's good. That should be the case, right? But <clears throat> for example, everyone has this light blue color. Well, okay, one second. So you are telling me that every first patient with liver cancer was a smoker, or a second hand smoker. That didn't seem very probable. Okay, even less probable MMR, which is associated to mismatch repair mechanisms, you know, the, the third one, everyone has it, okay? And then <clears throat> similarly, if you go to <clears throat> breast cancer, these are five plus just because there are so many patients in this data set that, you know, you need a five to, and also with different orders of magnitude of mutations that split in five. But basically the point is, <clears throat> again, age. See, this is the R factor, by the way, green. So very important in breast cancer, right? But still the orange, which is BRCA, we know that actually the BRCA mutation is present in a, in a relatively small fraction of breast cancer in women, mm. okay? But the NMF here is predicting, I mean, saying that pretty much every patient has it in pretty good quantities. Okay, so what is the problem? The problem is that, you know, NMF is a, is a good, methodology, there is nothing wrong with that. It's, a, it's an approach that we can use. And, and I'll show you, in fact, in one or two days, we are using it, so I'm not saying it's bad, but you know, it has limits. For example, because it's unsupervised, you have to decide how many signatures you want, right? So, and there are approaches to decide what is the right number of, you know, Signatures that you want the algorithm to speed up. Basically, the dimension of one of the dimension of those two matrices, right, in the product. Well, that has to be decide, decided. 
either by you or by some uh, approaches. And there are several. But unfortunately, in my point of view, at least applied to this data, none is doing a great job. Okay. And so what happens is that, you know, if there are truly four senators, but in that paper, I think they have 31. Okay. Now I just broke the signal of four senators across 31, uh, where none is really, you know, a true senator. So what we did here is we, <clears throat> we decided to, to do a test. And the following test, this is the following test. Um, so here is the probability distribution that I just described and the signature one, which is aging. So this is the, in a sense, you could say the R signature, okay? The signature of this just normal processes. Uh, I call, you know, normal replicative endogenous processes. So as you can see, the B peak, it's a C to T. Uh, funnily enough, my initials, by the way. And uh, if you look at that, there are, because there are really 96 triplets, right? But there are four that are really particularly high. And those are all C to T. So C, a C that has been changed to a T, where the flanking base to the right, so the next letter, it's a G. Okay, and there is a particular reason, but I won't, I won't go into that. I think some of you know in biology can imagine what that is. <laughs> okay, so this C to T followed by G, it's something that we have known for 20 years to be the senator of aging. Okay, we methodologies much, just by observation, okay? <clears throat> so that is not something that this mutational senator approach brought to the field. That was already known. Uh, and by the way, at that time of publication, we just called Senator One. Afterwards, by observing that in older patients, there was more of this than the inference was, this probably has to do with aging, right? <clears throat> okay, so the question is, is there any value in everything else? Because the Senator is a probability distribution. I have 96 features here, right? For, for each Senator. So, and so here, here is how I like to spend it. I, I produce random signatures, okay? So basically it's like I asked my daughter to write, to draw 31 mutational signatures, 31 pop, uh, drawing. I didn't ask her, but it's the same thing, right? So she draws 31 of these figures, however she wants them, okay? There is going to be one of them that has going to have more C2Ts than the other 30, yeah? Now I call that the aging senator. And now I can test how that performs in predicting older people, so aging, versus this one, okay? So there here, these are the random senator that I'm showing you. So for example, in this case, right? <clears throat> I will pick the green as my senator one because that happens to be the one with the peak right there. And I say, okay, how does this one? Okay, and the performance of this completely randomly generated signature was on par, if not slightly better than signature one for predicting age. So what that means is not that it's useless, the signature, but what that means that beside the fact that we have a peak as C2T, there is really no information there. It's just noise, yeah? Okay, but here we are lucky because we knew about the C2T mutation before doing this machine, you know, using this machine learning approach, okay? And so it's nice to actually see that using NMF, you can recapitulate an aging senator that at least on the peak looks correct. That's nice. The question is, what do you do for the others where you don't know, right? Is it working? And how much of the actual distribution can you trust, right? So that's, that's formed the basis for approaching in a different way. And I guess I'll stop here with this my last slide and, and tomorrow I'll, I'll take 10, 15 extra minutes for finishing this lecture, which is <clears throat> the idea was like, well, one, one point was like, why should, why should we not do a supervised if we can, right? And, and then I'll tell you how we deal with it when we don't know. Because, you know, if you don't have the labels, then you cannot do supervise. But if we can do supervise, why we don't? Because I think you all agree, right, that any method 
if I can su super, if I can do supervised learning, I better beat the unsupervised, or there is something really wrong with what I'm doing. Okay, so I thought let's do a super in a supervised way, and also let's not assume, because that was another fundamental assumption of the work, which was to assume that um, a mutational process cause a certain signature independently of which tissue you're looking at, okay? So if you look at, at that work, you know, Senator 4, which is, or 5, say, which is smoking. I think it's 4, the main one. Uh, <clears throat> um, that's smoking, okay? It doesn't come with smoking in lung. Or that's a smoking Senator, okay? Here, we didn't want to force that. We said, could it be that even aging or any factor really likes to make different mistakes in different organs. You know, the biology is different in different organs. Who knows, right? So that's what we did. And I'll tell you tomorrow about it. And that was really the machine learning part that, uh, that we did. But I guess we talked about NMF. So we did some machine learning today, technically. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll, I'll stop here for today. <clears throat> Thank you, Kristen. We had a lot of questions during the talk. Are there any concluding questions? Um, this was fascinating. Thank you. I was wondering, uh, my understanding was that to decide whether a uh, patient has a mutation, the, the cancer genome is compared with the normal genome, right? Of that patient, right? Ideally, yes. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, but of course, also the normal genome potentially has different mutation. I mean, passengers or what have you, right? So why don't people sequence more than one normal bit to understand what are the, you know, the, the truly random uh, unstable basis, let's say, and and come up with what are genuinely tumor drivers or something. Like that. Yeah, you uh, uh, fantastic question, and uh, you know, um, I I was looking at Sophie because this is the very paper we are working on right now. <laughs> it's a, I, I, it's a very important point, and uh, you know, I can I can just say. In general, the problem, if you're familiar with how sequencers work, the problem is that if you do bulk sequencing, where you're taking multiple cells, you know, in the soup and make a soup, then the sequencer will not call, well, then the caller will not call things that are not at least subclonal. And the reason is because the error of the sequencer is so high. So just to give you a sense, <clears throat> And I think you, I think I saw somewhere some sequencing lecture on sequencing too, right? Uh, or, or, or it's coming. I, I saw something on sequencing. But <clears throat> just to give you a rough estimate, let's say in colorectal cancer, uh, on the exome, which is one percent of the genome, about, we have say, uh, yeah, under mutation, typical number, fifty to hundred mutations. Okay, they are real. Uh, the sequencer adds one mutation every thousand bases. So the genome is 30 millions, right? 1%, it's what, 300,000, right? So now your signal has been completely obliterated. Like right? it's not that you can take the reads and say, oh, these are reads belonging to just different cells in the soup. Yeah, they are, and it's correct. But then the sequence has throws on them like orders of magnitude higher noise. So the only mutations that you're actually going to be able to call are mutations that are common among cells because the probability that mutation is by chance created on the sequencer by the sequencer on the same spot. It's very, very long, right? So that's how you call in bulk sequencing, that's how you call mutations. You see subclone, subclones, or you know. Uh, you look at the variant allele frequency, basically. That's how it's called. And you look at uh, colors can use 5%, for example. So you want to see at least 5% of the reads or more, okay? 
So one of the problems with uh, which is, uh, as I said, a fantastic question is, okay, but then, you know, in cancer, what is good about when you do it on cancer is that in cancer, because the final cell that had all the mutations required to be cancer, then expands and create your full blown cancer, all the daughter cells of the original cell contain the mutations of that mother cell, right? So when I do sequencing, bulk sequencing, in theory, all the mutations of the mother cell are clonal in all cells. So you can see when you sequence a cancer tissue, you are really getting the reading of the mutations present in the original first cancer cell, the one that became cancer and created the old clone. Okay. Um, but in a healthy tissue, where there is no one that's doing the suspension for you, uh, every cell is, has their own private mutations. And so, you know, there are approaches like single cell sequencing, where then you now sequence just one cell. But unfortunately, um, you know, they're not still there, in my opinion, at least. Uh, but yes, the, the field is definitely going in that direction because you want to know each cell, what each cell contains. You don't want to just know, you know, clonal mutations, basically, right? So yeah, it's, uh, and, and many are working on this. And, and um, uh, in fact, we are not working necessarily on improving the technology, even though I'm, I'm involving something else in that direction, but um, yeah, but we are working on a methodology to get around this problem, I guess, in, in some way. I think there was another, yes. Oh, microphone. Sorry, yeah. So um, I just wanted to ask, are the mutations in the primary tumor uh, and the secondary tumor like similar, even if they are on different organs? Like, in the primary tumor and in the, sec oh, secondary, yes. Yeah, after metastasis. Yeah, yeah, you definitely, uh, um, yeah, it's been shown many times that, you know, the original mutations that were present in primary tumor are, are usually present in the metastatic uh, parts of the tumor. They are in other organs. Yes, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I think there is one more. Uh, first, thanks for the report and lecture. Uh, I have a question and uh, I want to uh, know your idea about it. If I want to answer this question, how much random is the cancer? Uh, does it make sense? And if yes, what is the scientific approach to answer this question? Uh, sorry, what is the scientific? The scientific approach to answer it. Yes. So um, first, of, that's a great question. Let me be a little, uh, a little bit of a mathematician here. When you say random, it's very, uh, it's very important to define what we mean with that. Because, for example, when WHO criticize our paper, one of the things they said is, we all know that cancer is random. Now, they didn't describe, I mean, you know, why? Because of course, cancer is a random phenomena, whether it's, I can be a smoker all my life and not get cancer, right? So what I just showed you is not really about just being random. It's this, uh, I call them random replicative mutations. So to, to, to answer your question, I need to understand do you mean uh, the R factor for random? How much of the cancer is due to these endogenous processes? Uh, is that the question? Uh, if I uh, want to uh, uh, clarify my question, uh, we can hand, uh, we can talk about randomness in two uh, different ways. First, uh, we have lack of knowledge, and that's why we use this randomness to formulate it. Sometimes, maybe, this randomness is a nature of the phenomena. And uh, this year, I'm, uh, I, I read some papers in Nature, in Science, and they say, uh, for example, uh, how much is the muta cancer mutations are random? And they yeah. try to answer it. But it is, uh, I think it is not, a, uh, I, 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 I really not satisfied with the answer. When we say how much random is the uh, cancer driver mutations or how much uh, random is the uh, cancer. Uh, 
um, yeah, so back to question, does it make yeah. sense? And I, I completely agree. And in fact, you know, I lived a little bit of that with some, even in our study, some of the media translated our study as, you know, how much a cancer is random. What they really meant and they should have said is how much a cancer is, you know, this endogenous processes. That's really the question, okay? But in a sense, you know, I understand at the general population level, right? I think they understand what that means. If you say how much the cancer is random, meaning it's not something that you are causing to yourself. How much cancer is just an internal process that happens anyway, all right? But to be more precise, yes, if we're talking about how much the cancer is endogenous, then that is actually a very scientific question. And I think there are many ways to address it. You know, the, the correlation I showed you was not a proof, but definitely was an association that to me was screaming for this thing plays a major role. How much? I cannot say from that analysis. Another way, which I didn't show, just showed you the final answer, is proportional mutations that you assign. Okay? One way is with the mutational signatures. As you can see, I can take a patient. Now, this particular technique might not be particularly good, but still, it's doing some job in saying this much is due to smoking, this much is due to aging, and that can assign mutations to the different, you know, etiological factors. Uh, another way to do it is, for example, looking at mutational loads. As an example, we know the smokers on average have about three to four times the mutation rate of a healthy individual, non-smoker, okay? And in fact, there is a little bit of a mathematical rule. You can take that to a power of two, right? So four to the square, 16. In fact, it's more like 2.5, and you get a, a, an increase in mutation rate of four implies an increase of in risk, lifetime risk of something like between 20 and 30 times, which is exactly what you observe for smokers. So now, if I look at the population of smokers, I usually see <clears throat> in a lung cancer about four times, three to four, say three, say three, muta three times more mutations than in a healthy individual in a po other population. If a person with lung cancer, smoker, came to me and said, can you tell me what is the proportion of mutations that was due to smoking? I'll say, if I don't sequence your DNA, I cannot tell you. I can tell you based on population data that what I observed that is that you are probably going to have 300 mutations instead of 100. Mm -hmm. So probably two thirds of the mutation load that you have in your cancer was due to your smoking. And I think that's a scientific answer. It's population-based. Uh, but, you know, so, so those are ways in which you can ans answer that question. Thanks. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's time to, to close. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank and uh, uh, we will uh, reconvene again tomorrow morning with a lecture by Gasper and, uh, and then the sessions in the afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you.